Ephesians chapter 2, and this is where we're going to launch from today. And uh, people have the idea about God that, that he is a harsh taskmaster, that uh, he's basically Vito Corleone uh, in a different form. Um, and, and so when we come to God, when we come to him, we do discover that he is almighty. He's got all the power in heaven and earth. It all belongs to him. But God doesn't have to flex his muscle to show us who he is. From everlasting to everlasting, and Psalm 90 says, he's God. That means that God's God today, God was God tomorrow, God will be, uh, God will be God tomorrow, God was God yesterday, God is God inside and outside of time. Yes. Praise God forevermore. Amen. So when we look at what it means to be a member of the family, it leads in with this verse 1, and you who made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So, it's, so let me just say that it's possible to be a member of another family first. You're a son of disobedience before something else came along. You were a member of the wrong family. And then he says, among those who we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature. By, does everybody say nature? Nature. So there's something that has to happen supernaturally. You see the word nature there that's connected to supernatural? Supernatural, sometimes we think the idea of supernatural means, you know, like because there's 150 vampire TV shows, we think that's what supernatural is. Vampires and ghosts and and wizards and, you know, Harry Potter and all these kinds of things. Supernatural. You take nature, but there's a superlative of that. And that is when God does something that, and God never, listen, God never works outside of nature. He brings a super to that nature. We'll talk more about that in the future, but we, we know that by, so nature alone is not enough. And Paul here, who wrote the book of Ephesians, is writing to people that were non-Jewish. And we'll talk more about that next Sunday. But he was, he was letting them know that by nature, everybody is in the wrong family. So he's, he, being a Jewish person that came to Jesus, understands that being Jewish is not enough. Having a granddad for a preacher is not enough. Being born, maybe, maybe even being born in a church building is not enough. Uh, you know, someone said this years ago, is that you can live in a garage, but it doesn't make you a car. <laughs> so something supernatural, say supernatural, 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 something supernatural has to take place, and here Paul begins to discuss what this was. One more time from verse 3. Among those we once walked according to our, the lust of our flesh, filled with the desires of the flesh, and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, man, those are the two most powerful words in the Bible. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. But, God, but God, the situation now will change. This is what this is what the scriptures are telling us. But God, who is rich in mercy, yes. because of his great love, with he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Amen. If you're saved today and you know it, say amen. amen. Praise God. And if you don't know it, then you're going to have the opportunity to know for sure today before you leave this building. Isn't that awesome to know today? Praise God. You have been saved by grace and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, before we get to verse 8, I just want to let you know, I want to make you an offer that I hope you won't refuse. Vito says it this way. He says, I, I, I'm going to make you an offer you can't refuse. But the truth of the matter is, is that since God is loving and kind and full of mercy and compassion, is that he makes us an offer that we can refuse. And, and, and a thinking person 
is going to say, why in the world would I refuse something so tremendous? And yet there are hundreds and thousands of people that reject the grace of God every day in America and around the world. So if, if, if listen, if God is forcing me to accept him, then that's no choice at all. God knows everything. God knows the end from the beginning, and yes, God does know who is saved and who is lost. Now, here's the tremendous conundrum that we have about this, that if, well, if God already knows everything, then, then, then what's the sense of me even praying or doing anything? Because we're talking about Almighty God. You're comparing your knowledge to Almighty God's. <laughs> and remember, remember when you were a teenager and you knew everything? And then when you got to be about 40, you realize, I don't know much of anything. And, and as time goes on, you realize, well, I don't know anything. Now, those days are coming if you're not already there. But when, when we, we compare our knowledge to the knowledge of God, and we consider that the, someone had said, well, why doesn't God just go ahead and automatically just declare everybody, there's just people that teach that and preach that, everybody ultimately will be saved. And, oh, how I wish that were true. But again... There are people that reject the love of God. And we say, well, why doesn't God just force it to happen? Because God knows everything, and one of the things that he gives us is the opportunity to choose. Now, there are people that are preaching, and teaching and churches all over uh, America that, no, no, you couldn't choose to be born again anymore. You can choose to be born. Here's the difference, is that everybody that comes to Christ comes to him through adoption. Everybody say adoption. So we know we're not born naturally. We're born how? Supernaturally, right? We're born supernaturally. We're not born naturally. We're born supernaturally. All right, all right. This time I want you to yell, okay? You're not, we're not born naturally. We're born supernaturally. Amen. And so, and so the, no one can lay a claim to this idea of, well, if God wants me to be saved, I know I'm going to be saved, so there's nothing I can do about it. Yep, you sure can. You can repent of your sins. You can come to Him. You can make a choice. It's God's decision, but it's my choice. God knows everything and gives me the choice. God knows the end from the beginning, but gives me a choice. I have the ability to make a decision. Isn't that tremendous? It's a responsibility of the human race that I can make a decision to come to Him. Verse 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Let's read it out loud together, shall we? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Now, Pastor, you just contradicted yourself. The Bible just says right there, this is not your own doing. Well, what part isn't my doing? The part of my part that is not my doing is right here. It is a gift. So I can't do anything about someone deciding to give me a gift. Here's a funny thought about birthdays. Here's a funny thought about birthdays. Is, you know, we, we celebrate the person that got born on their birthday. Well, we really ought to be celebrating mom who is in labor. <laughs> They're the ones that ought to be getting the gifts and the prizes, you know. It's an amazing thing. So when we come to Christ, when we come to Him, when we accept it, here's, here's our part. We're accepting the gift. Is that it, it's a, if it's a gift, you know, I don't know about you, but when you work a week at, at, at your job uh, and you walk in and the boss uh, gives you a check in and say, here's just a little something uh, because of all your hard work. I just want to give you a little gift here. You say, gift? What are you talking about? I worked 45 hours this week. I worked 60 hours this week. It's not a gift. That, that is the work I've done, and I'm getting the, the recompense due to me because of my work. Does that make sense? That's a little trick that companies use. We say you get benefits. Benefits. That's a funny word in business because when you leave that company, guess what? You don't get the benefits anymore. So it's not a benefit. It's, it, it's pay that is unspoken of in your salary. So we have to understand the difference between works and gifts. Gifts are things that we don't earn and we don't deserve. That's what a gift is. You didn't work for it. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. And, and, and we, we, we just have to grab a hold of that understanding that that is grace that has saved us. God's grace that has saved us. 
God's faith that has worked inside of us, and the work of that has happened through us receiving the gift of God. So when I when I repent of my sins, when I turn my life over to Christ, I accept His free gift of salvation. Does that make sense to anybody? Look at the look at the contrast and the comparison of, of we just, we just read some of these verses already, but. Oh, i got to make the PowerPoint bigger next week. All right. I just wanted to notice that. Especially those of you taking notes. And, and it, here it is. It is. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says I was dead. I was unsaved. I was an outsider. I was in conflict. I was, I was not a, a person. I was alone. And I didn't have a place to live. This is talking about our supernatural condition. Is that the Bible says you were dead. Now, now there's another time to, to be dead, and that is to be dead to ourselves, but, but this, is, this is talking about that we were made alive who were dead, and what our death sentence was, was the fact that, here's, here's the deal, that we were born. We were born in sin. There's no person on the planet that's ever been born of a woman except Jesus that was not born in to sin. He said, well, that's unfair. Really, it's unfair. Well, we, let me just tell you this morning, is you and I don't want God to be fair. You say, what? That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. No, 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 listen. If God's going to be fair, then he's going to give me what I deserve. And I don't want God to give me what I deserve. I want God to give me what I don't deserve. I want the gift. I don't want the recompense. I don't want to be paid. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. We have to compare the enormous gift. We have to see what a fantastic gift the gift is. How it overwhelms. How it shadows. How it just dwarfs the trespass. Hallelujah. You were dead in your sins. You were dead. You were walking around like a dead man. You were a zombie. You were unsaved. Which meant you were not being preserved for a future use. You were an outsider. We were outsiders. We didn't belong to a group. Now I want to help you contextualize this in Bakersfield, California compared to what Paul was talking about to people that thought that just because they were Jewish that they were already in and the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people were saying, well I'm already out because I'm non-Jewish. You were an outsider. But let me be, bring it more practical. Is that there are people, let me just say, saved and unsaved that don't understand this. There are people saved and understand and say that don't understand this, and that is we don't really realize that it's in, we want to be an insider. We want to get into somebody's group. Well, the only group that really matters that you're in is in the family of God. Right. Yeah. Because if every listen, if every other person on the earth hates your living guts, if God loves you, hallelujah, and gave his life for you, glory to God, and has saved you from the hand of the devil and has put new life inside of you, why would you care about being a part of some other group? Hallelujah! Praise God for the Lord! That's what the Jewish people would call the Mishpaha, the family of God, is that we realize is that is that really grabbing a hold of I, I'm not in that circle I'm not in that group number uh, uh, and the next one is that we're in conflict people before they come to Christ are in conflict you know who you're in conflict with the most with not with God but with the person standing in the mirror you're in conflict people are in conflict they're, they're, they're hoping that they can get a better job a better home a better spouse better kids better schools better air quality whatever the case may be I don't know if you watched the news this week, but I did. I haven't watched the news for over a year. And I watched the news this week and realized, boy, I need to give up, give up watching the news. <laughs> Again. <laughs> and they're like, Bakersfield is the worst place in the world to raise kids. That's what they announced. <laughs> like we're supposed to have a party about it. Well, let's change it. Let's change the script. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Let's be the church. Let's be the family of God that says, you just wish you lived in Bakersfield. Amen. Yes. Yes. That God's doing a new work. God's doing a work inside of us. And we're not in conflict anymore. We're not wishing that we had a better station in life. We're not hoping and coping for those kind of things. And the next one says that you weren't a... Uh, you don't remember when a certain individual was running for president 
and they said that, that, a, that a baby in the womb is a non-person. Yeah. yeah. And that even now the dark, darkness upon our land, that, that even to the point where that child is breaching, the, the, uh, coming out of the womb, that it is legal to take that child's life. We're in bad shape in America. Yes. But the reason why that we get to these places is because we should value life more yes. of, of saying, I'm not of this race, I'm not of this belonging, I'm not of this thing, I, and, and even be considered the dark days upon American history is that people were a non-person, is that if you weren't white, then basically you weren't anything. What a ridiculous notion, amen? That, that, that to hold on to something as, as minimal as the, the, the color of our skin. We'll talk about that more next week. But there are people that would say, you weren't a people. Now, Paul's declaring this. He'd say, you weren't a people. And he'd say, non-Jewish people, you weren't even a people. You weren't because of, of the structure that went on in that time. But you were also alone. And you were also without a place to call home. But the contrast to that, beloved, is that when you come to Christ and you're dead in your trespasses, He makes you alive. Yes. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. He makes you alive. Yes. Yes. When, when, when Paul's talking about when Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ shall rise, he's not talking about the church. Right. The dead in the pews. <laughs> he's talking about the dead people that are underground, that they'll rise first. Yes. Yes. And so we are to listen. We, you know, we are. You, do you know how the easiest way to find out if someone is alive is put a mirror up to their nose, right? <laughs> and when we're made alive, if we're made alive like like uh, God in Genesis uh, made alive Adam, and the Bible says He breathed into Adam the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. Hallelujah. I just got to tell you, church member, Christ follower, is that if you're alive, somebody ought to know that you're alive. Yes. Amen. 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 They, they shouldn't have to come by and stick a mirror up under your nose to find out if you're alive. There's, there's something that He breathed into you. He breathed into you the Spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. Who is the Holy Spirit? Well, we don't have a whole sermon to devote just to that subject this morning, but here's the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that all things are made by Him, Jesus working in tandem with the Holy Spirit and the Father there too as well, creating life. And when He breathed into Adam, Adam, you see every other animal on the planet, just, you know, be there, be there horse, be there cow, be there elephant, be there uh, ostrich. But when he got to mankind, he breathed into him something that is the spirit more than just breath. The spirit of the living God. The spirit of life. And that same spirit. Hallelujah. The Bible says that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead makes alive our mortal bodies. Praise God forevermore. You're not just breathing air on planet Earth. You're not just a, a human being. You're a supernatural being. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the living God this morning. And when he saved you, he saved you as a past event. But he saved you as a present, and he saves you for the future. You, you, there, there's a threefold salvation that goes in on when you come to Christ. Is that sometimes people refer to getting saved as some past tense event, and, and they wish that they just die and go to heaven. But God didn't save you just for you to wait around and die. God saved you to live now. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. Now your future is in Him. Amen. Yes. Just like salvation is Him. It's all in Him. All the blessings of God are, are treasured up in God's storehouse for the benefit of humans. And He has saved you for a purpose. Yes, Amen. Say it out loud. I'm saved for a purpose. I'm saved for a purpose. It's a whole lot more than just you're getting your don't go to hell card. Hallelujah. God has more important things for you to do than just say, well, thank God I'm not going to hell. Right, amen. I mean, thank God you're not when you're saved. 
I mean, that's something to rejoice about. But that's, that, that's the beginning part. Is that you were dead, now you're alive. We just talked about that. But now you're saved for a purpose. You're saved from the old and you're saved to the new. That's why water baptism symbolizes an important thing. Is that you, you go down and sometimes pastors are tempted to hold you down. <laughs> I don't know if this guy's going to live right or not, Lord. Just kind of take him home now. You're, you're. <laughs> the old man is dead, and you're raised to newness of life. The same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead does that work inside of you. You go from being an outsider to being an insider. Is that Jesus is talking to the disciples one day. And he says, now, now, now boys, I'm going to tell you, I haven't told you specifics about my life. I've been treating you like disciples, but now I'm going to call you my friends. We sang that song this morning. And we realize what a tremendous announcement of faith that is to say, I'm a friend of God. Because the Bible says, I used to be an enemy of His. I used to be a son of disobedience. I used to walk according to whatever I thought I wanted to do today. But now I'm a friend of God. I'm, a, I'm in friendship with Him. The friendship level. Now, I have to tell you the straight truth is that there's a lot of Christ followers that never get to this point in their life. It's just sad. Because they think God's mad at them all the time. And if they get sick, they think they did some kind of horrible sin. And, and just to live in this realm of condemnation all the time. When, you, when God has already set you free... And you, and you don't know that you have been. You're walking around like you're not. Yeah. And I, I had the privilege of serving in the Army. And uh, the day they issued weapons to us, they didn't give us bullets because they knew we weren't ready to use them yet. But there comes a point where you realize, and everything in the Army is dummy-proof. There was a thing that you put in uh, uh, called a, 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 a Claymore landmine, and it said on the, on the front, front toward the enemy. <laughs> oh, I can do that. Boot toward the enemy. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> when God gives us something, He's not planning on taking it back, but He expects us to use what He's given us. Amen. And so, by, by, by being an insider, God now shares with me the things that I need to know. And He shares those things with me as I grow in Him. And I don't just sit there and, 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 and just kind of hang out and wait for Jesus to come back. And he is coming back at any moment, at any time. I hope he comes right now today. Yeah. But in the meantime, there's work to do. Yeah. And he doesn't share that information with those that are not interested. He shares it with those that want the information. I'm going to call you my friends because uh, he says the master doesn't tell his employees their business. But I'm going to tell you my business because... You're my friends. Isn't that tremendous? Yeah. To think that God Almighty through His Son Jesus Christ wants to partner with us. Yeah. That is beyond my comprehension. So I'm saved. I'm an insider. And I have peace with God. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Yeah. One thing that Faith and I have uh, rejoiced with over the years is that friends would come to play with our children and families would come to visit at our house. And even growing up, uh, I lived on a, on a farm. Uh, we, weren't, we were garden farmers. But the big fancy houses were down the road a little bit. And I had some friends that lived in the big fancy houses. And my friend in high school said to me years later, he said, Darius, I loved coming to your house because there was always such peace there. And, 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 and my wife is visiting with a friend while we were serving in, a, in, in another state. And uh, this lady was friends, uh, this kid was friends with my son. And they were not, were not believers. And, uh, and we went and to their house and uh, ate food and played board games. And these were people that had big means. They, had, you know, they went on uh, bird watching trips to Costa Rica and you know things like this and 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 the, the, the spouse said to faith she said she said oh that's the best time we've ever had in our life 
And we're thinking, what did we do? We ate food and played board games. Why? Because the presence of peace was there. And we just left working for Boys Town. And, and, and one of our, again, people are watching your lives, folks. People are watching your lives. One of our, one of our uh, uh, fellow employees said to us when we were leaving, they said, oh, there's such peace whenever we come over to your house. And this is living with kids that are of high uh, uh, bad behavior. And we thought, what? <laughs> but what God does is that he announces peace over you. This is what, listen to the prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah 52. It says, how beautiful are the feet of him who bring the gospel of peace, announcing good news, announcing on the mountains that this good news, this gospel of peace is coming to you. This is not, listen, peace is not the absence of conflict. It is peace in the middle of conflict. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is God announcing over you shalom, the shalom of God, the peace that passes understanding. That's what belongs to the one that has chosen to follow Jesus. Isn't that awesome? Amen. You're a citizen of heaven. The Bible says here that he's made you to sit. And I know right now you're not physically there. But you, as the old red the hand, or the red black hymnal had, is that you're a citizen of two worlds. You're you you live here, and you've got to live here until God takes you home. Home. That's what we call going home. That's why we're in the family room today, so we can practice what it's like one day when we go home. And God has made you a citizen of heaven. You were alone, but now you're together. Anything that, listen, listen, uh, Southwest Christian Church, anything that we do ministry-wise has got to be done together. Amen. Together. Yes. Together. Because the pastor is not sent to build his empire. The pastor is sent to lead the sheep to build the kingdom of God. Yes. And so how can we do that alone? We do that together by say together. Together. together we build the kingdom of God. Together we live together. We we cry together. We, we rejoice together. We do these things together. And I'm not talking about being some kind of weird cult. I'm talking about being the family of God. Yes, amen. And then it says that not only has God given you that future home in heaven, but now He has sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. That you are the temple of God. Oh, isn't that exciting? Yes. Praise God. The contrast that we see about this is that God said, I'm going to build a, 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 a home inside of you. And uh, we can ask ourselves, what kind of home do I want to live in? Now, you know, Faith and I, we, we found a place to live. We, we, we put the down payment in tomorrow. Woohoo! We're excited about that. Yeah. Say, this morning I thought somebody stole our vehicle. I couldn't find it in the parking lot. I was like, oh! God compares what we live on this earth to what he does on this earth. Natural versus supernatural. There's two words that are used in the, in, in the Hebrew parts of scripture. And that is shekinah and shekinah. And, uh, and, and living in Christ means that Christ is living in me. It's, it's a two-way street. Is that I am living in Christ when I, when I, by grace, I've been saved through faith. It's not my own doing. It's the gift of God. And that should cause me to understand that it's not only what God is doing in me, but now I am living in Him. And, and a shikuna is a, is a tenement dwelling. It, it's a shack. It's a, it, it's, a, it's a rental property. It's something that, that you're under the thumb of somebody else. As a matter of fact, we use this old term still today, a landlord. This is a, going back to ancient uh, English times, but we still use that term, that you're a landlord. And, and, and uh, I don't know, uh, in one particular congregation we pastored years ago, the folks said, the parsonage is part of the church and it's ours anytime we want to get in there. So sometimes they just walk right in the door. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> that was kind of weird. <laughs> but their mindset was, we're the owners and you're the occupiers. <laughs> The shakuna is is at best. That's what we're really saying is that in, in the in the word shakuna is that at best you've got a temporary place to dwell. But shekinah, oh hallelujah, 
Shekinah is what followed them, the pillar of cloud by night and, the, and, and, and by, fire by night and cloud by day. This is in the book of Exodus. When the people were out in the middle of, listen, they were out in the middle of the wilderness, but there was a visible manifestation of the glory of God, the Shekinah, that they could see the glory of God. Hallelujah. There's hope and glory in Shekinah. It was long as you're in Shekinah, you're just <coughs> paying rent. But when you're in Shekinah, now you're, there's weightiness. You feel the weight of ownership and you are dwelling with God. This is so important. God has been teaching this from Genesis and he finishes in Revelation and he says in Revelation, behold, the dwelling place of God is now with men. But when we're saved and we're walking with him, we begin to say, well, God, how can it possibly get any better? It's going to get better. Yeah. It's, got, it's only going to get better, child of God. Well, I got this sickness in my body. It's only going to get better, child of God. Well, I got this rebellious kid. It's only going to get better, child of God. Well, my spouse isn't saved. It's only going to get better, child of God, because you are under the Shekinah glory of God. You are under His tent. You are under His tabernacle. You are in His dwelling place. Hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. We are his workmanship. That's what he's doing. He's building in us a temple. Look what it says in Ephesians 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Hallelujah. Now, we, Pastor, you just said it's, it's not of works. It's not of works. You can't become a Christian by working harder. You come to God by faith. And he employs 100% of his family. God's a farmer. How many of you know farmers? Now, people don't do this a lot in America anymore, but I grew up in a farming community, and all my, all my Catholic friends had big families. 8, 10, 12, 14 kids, somewhere along the line, they decided to not listen to the Pope anymore or something. And you don't have big Catholic families anymore like you used to, but big families. Well, that, that, that family was not only obeying the dictates of the Pope, they were also farmers, and that farmer needed employees, and so they had a big family so they could get the harvest in. They had a big family so they could work the ground. So God wants a big family. And I don't know if this is news to you, but God's got a job for you to do. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. I've read the Bible from cover to cover, and yet to find the spiritual gift of sitting on the pew and not doing anything. It's not a spiritual gift. <laughs> Some people really think, well, I come to Christ, I'm sitting on the pew, and I'm waiting for Jesus to come back. And, uh, you know, he might come back on Highway 99. You'll be here, you know, sitting on the pew. He's coming everywhere. I'm just kidding. Being facetious. <laughs> But we're work. We are his workmanship, created in him to do good works. It's the Bible word poema. It really means masterpiece. And, and so I'm going to show you a comparison of a masterpiece here. Is that is that you can have this kind of masterpiece? If we can go to the next slide, is uh, we have uh, we have the one over here with Groucho Marx eyes and nose, and that's not very beautiful. But then we have Mona Lisa over here. That, 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 is unvar that is unvarnished. It is the pure work. It's, when, it, when you Google the word masterpiece, this picture will come up. And when you Google the word uh, Mona Lisa uh, with a mustache, then this will come up. <laughs> and you see, we, we have to understand in this comparison what God has done inside of you. What God is doing and will continue to do inside of you. The next slide is going to show that that he is going to continue the work inside of you. We are his masterpiece, another translation says. We're his masterpiece. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I think I said it last Sunday. Is Everybody else may think that you're a jerk, but Jesus loves you and thinks that you're his masterpiece. He believes... He believes that your is your his work that he's continuing to work on. And so, well, listen, when you get saved, you're 100% saved. And God has work to do on you. When I got saved, I got 100% saved. 
but God has work to do on me. And so I'm still on the potter's wheel. And when I go to serve him and work for him, there are things that he does for me and in me that, that are wonderful. And when that happens, I know that I can't take any of the credit or any of the glory. And when I do something goofy and have to repent, I know I can take all the responsibility. Are you hearing me? Yeah. And so God is working. He's working on me. He's working on you. God has prepared a work for you to do. You may think that your days of serving the Lord are over, but I've got good news for you. No, they're not. Now, how do you know when your days are over? It's when you go to the funeral home and you send your sister off to glory land. That's when you know your time's up. Amen. Until that time, until there's breath in your body, you are to be in the labor for the Lord. And you can't do that without the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit working inside of you. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me bring this last scripture to you. And then let's go to God in prayer. Is that in, in verse 14... It says, how does God do this? How does God do this? How does God do all these things? The Bible says in verse 13, Now in Christ, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, because he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Whatever, listen, whatever has separated you from God, Jesus tore it down on the cross. Yes. I'm saying something that happened to you last week. Jesus tore it down the cross. There are people that have issues with God over what some person did to them. But Jesus tore it down on the cross. I love this picture of Jesus on the cross because uh, it, it shows all these things. The Bible says that he took all these things upon himself. He took every life's disappointment upon himself. Next slide. It shows that he took this... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's... In 1960, they built the, the Berlin Wall. And uh, this wall was to separate West Berlin from East Berlin. And that's the way it was. And people were looking over. Some of you are too young to even remember this. Is that there was a wall built. Even though that people lived in freedom on one side, they didn't live in freedom on the other side. There was a wall that was built down, but uh, built up. And then Ronald Reagan, who's the president, uh, said these famous words. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. This was an impacting moment in American history and in world history because for years no one had talked about the wall. Let me just say this to you, is that the comparison I'm making, the illustration, is that there are things, listen, there are issues in our lives that we think as long as I'm living, I'm going to have this problem, I'm going to have this, this, this thing that's in my life. But someone may come into your life and they'll begin to confront you in a godly way. And they'll say, why are you still walking around with that thing on you? Jesus already tore it down. And that's what happened in, in 1989. Is that the wall came down. There's a bulldozer. You can see it. A big crowd gathered. Can you imagine getting to be there that day? To see something that people thought this wall will be up forever and ever and ever. But what the good news for us today is that that happened in the natural. But Jesus did this in the supernatural. Is that the peace of his cross, the peace through strength, his strength, the peace of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory. The peace of the cross of Jesus. You, you may not be able to read it, but all kinds of sin is listed up here, and names are listed up here, and, and, and all disappointments uh, are listed up here. And you can see some of them greed and adultery and envy and hate and pornography and, and uh, uh, seeing outside uh, of, of the world. There are people that have all these kinds of, and I love what this old preacher said. He said, you got hang-ups? He was hung up for your hang-ups. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. That this is what brought peace to you. It pulls the wall down. My, my question to you this morning, and you were asked this morning, you were, you were encouraged this morning when the worship was going on, that if you don't know the Lord is your Savior. Today can be your day. Today can be your day to be saved, to be by faith, to trust in Jesus Christ. Would you just bow your heads for a moment? And I want to talk to the Lord 